is wonderful to be here. So I want to thank uh, all the organizers of the of the Spring School for inviting me to speak. And I just want to repeat what I said a moment ago, which is that I cannot see the uh, the chat window at all. So if you want to ask a question, please do it uh, audibly, uh, and I will respond. So just interrupt me whenever you want. Um, okay. So uh, a few months ago, uh, Simon wrote to me and said, would you like to give a lecture at this school on the subject of quantum formal methods? And uh, I said yes, even though I don't really know anything about quantum formal methods, but I hope that this will be an acceptable talk nonetheless. So my name is Ross Duncan, and um, I work for a private company called Cambridge Quantum Computing. Uh, we are based in the UK, mostly in Cambridge, as you might guess from the name, and we are focusing on quantum software. Now, in the near future, we will be opening an office in Munich, and, and it is likely that sometime soon after that, we will looking, be looking to establish another office in uh, Paris or somewhere else in France. So please, if you would like to uh, join the company, get in touch with me and we'll talk about possibilities. So one of the main projects that I'm involved with at CQC is a piece of software called Ticket. And Ticket is a compiler which works on multiple languages and multiple platforms and it's specially designed for working with NISC devices. Now I will explain a little bit later on what is meant by NISC devices, but I'm not really going to spend a lot of time talking about Ticket today. In fact, I'm not going to talk about it at all. But I wanted to take this moment to encourage those of you who are Python users to try it out for yourself because it's free. And the command to install it is pip install PyTicket. OK, so let's. Uh, I have decided to break the talk into two parts. The first part will be the shorter part and will be more um, of an overview of different subjects um, related to some ideas around quantum formal methods. And then I propose to have a small uh, pause to get questions and to catch our breaths. And then I'll move on to the more substantial second part where I'm going to talk a bit more about category theory, diagrams, and in particular, the ZX calculus. OK, and without further ado, let's continue. So part one, quantum formal methods. So as I said a few moments ago, I don't really know the answer to this question, what are quantum formal methods? Or at least I didn't uh, when Simon asked me to do this talk. Uh, but I feel that the best way to introduce the topic of uh, quantum formal methods is by just asking what are formal methods in the first place, because it wasn't something that was invented for quantum computing. And if we were to answer what are formal methods all about in classical computing, then the answer would be quite simply there about verification. Now, my dictionary in my computer tells me that verification is the process of establishing the truth accuracy or validity of something. Now, unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, my computer dictionary doesn't know very much about quantum computing, because if it did, it would have to write two different conflicting definitions of this word. So the more traditional meaning of verification in computer science is all about ensuring that your program is correct. Uh, correct in the sense of being free from errors and in the sense of implementing what it was required to implement. So if your program is not correct, it might crash, or it might give the wrong answer when you ask a question to it, or it might deadlock, or behave some, displays some other behavior that we don't want. And so you can think of the, the traditional verification as checking yourself. Did you write the correct program when you were, when you were typing your code into the editor? Now, that is the less well-known uh, definition in the quantum world, where people tend to believe that verification is about checking that the quantum computer is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, typically, when we say that, we mean that the quantum computer is actually generating the right kind of entangled states 
and it is producing some, some resource states that we can use to gain some kind of quantum advantage rather than just producing a random noise. Uh, so that can that is the, the more common use of the word in quantum computing, but that is not what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be coming at it from the, the classical point of view that we're thinking about how to make sure that our programs are correct. Now, if you were to ask a programmer or software engineer um, when you're in your own practice, how do you ensure that your program is correct? Or how do you give yourself confidence that your program is correct? Um, obviously, some programmers are more confident than others, just generally speaking. But most people, if they give you an answer, will say testing is the very first thing they do. But the software engineering world proposes lots of methods for trying to ensure the correctness of software. Yeah, so code review is very common. Uh, writing programs with respect to a particular coding standard to make them easy to follow and understand and harder to make errors, uh, adhering to certain architectural patterns, which again, for, make it more difficult to make errors. Uh, testing is of course the main one, and we're gonna come back to that in a moment. But the key point of all these things is they're quite informal. They might be high process, there might be a lot of bureaucracy involved, but they're not mathematically rigorous. And that's the, the difference between informal methods and formal methods. Now, my, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be a little bit broader in my understanding of the term formal methods than is sometimes the case. So in particular, the use of types in programming language, I'm going to think of as a formal method, all kinds of static analysis, and in particular, model checking and theorem proving will also be considered to be formal methods which is more traditional. Okay, so let's come back to the question of, of testing in software. So in the simplest case, when we say we're going to test a program or a subroutine or a function, the idea is that given this program, if it takes inputs of type A and produces outputs of type B, then a test consists of a pair of an input and an output such that we believe that giving this input to the program will produce that output. So f of a equal to b. The re it's not always clear why we would believe that that is the correct behavior of the program. Perhaps it's written in the spec. Uh, perhaps it's informally specified. But if the program does indeed return b when given input a, it passes the test. Now, that's a very, very simple, minimalistic idea of a test. A more complex and realistic idea would be think of the test as a higher order program which accepts the program to be tested as its input and does something with it, probably many things, perhaps building up a large environment around it and generally exercising the program uh, and then it return true or false, whether or not it was satisfied with the answer of the test. And if, if the answer is true, we say the test is passed. Now that's a lot more appropriate for the vast majority of programs which are not functions, which have some state or which have some side effects, or which interact with the environment in a way which isn't so easy to capture in a functional relationship. And if we think about the weaknesses of testing with respect to classical programs, there is quite a lot of them. I mean, as a minimum thing, can't test a program that doesn't run. So it must be at least completed and it must have suitable hardware to run on, sorry. Um, any test suite will only contain a finite number of inputs, and we can't explore all the possible states of the program. As I hope our higher order example suggested, tests are themselves programs. They can have quite complicated behavior, and they can themselves have errors in them. It happens quite often in that the uh, a test will fail, but the, uh, the test is wrong, in which case we can't say the program is right, we just don't know anything about the program. Um, and in the case of realistic programs, we don't have a complete specification of all of its behavior in every circumstance. So we do rely on the programmers to interpret what's the correct basis when they write the tests. 
Now, of course, the most famous weakness of testing is the tests can only reveal bugs. They can't prove that there are no bugs. Um, and that is the essential point of difference between testing and formal methods. So in contrast to testing, formal methods, we always rely on having some kind of mathematical model of the program. And by exploring this model, we believe that we learn things about the program itself. Uh, in consequence, that usually means one can analyze the program without having to run it. And we can prove theorems about the mathematical model, and that can give guarantees that certain errors are not present in the program. Uh, we might be able to prove, for example, that the program will always terminate, uh, in which case we know that it will, that it will never hang in real use. Um, the kinds of things that we can prove or check about programs using formal methods are typically exp expressed in some kind of formal logic. And different logics are used for different programming languages and for different problem domains and for different properties that need to be checked. And in general, uh, formal methods work a lot better if the program itself has, uh, sorry, if the programming language has a formal semantics. Unfortunately, many programming languages in wide use today don't have formal semantics, and it's not always totally clear what is the intended behavior of a given program. Notably, the, the C language historically has lots of corners where its behavior is left up to the implementer to decide, um, uh, which is obviously not ideal if you would like to prove that your program has a given behavior when there's nothing to tell you what that behavior should be. So let's look at some examples of the kinds of things that I'm going to consider uh, in this talk. So the first thing is, of course, types. Almost all programming languages today have some notion of type. And the idea is simply that if I'm expecting to receive a string, you're not going to give me a, uh, an integer. If I'm expecting to receive a pointer to something, I'm not going to receive uh, a null byte, and so on. So in the type systems, which I like, types are static, which means that they are known at compile time. And therefore, the compiler can check the types of the entire program. And many languages are of this kind. And I'm focusing on the functional languages here, OCaml, Haskell, F Sharp, uh, Agda, Idris, and there are plenty more, uh, which have st um, static types, of course, but also polymorphic types and lots of more interesting features of their type system, which are not found in many other languages. Or if they are found, they're not as well implemented, uh, in, for example, in Java or C++. Another approach to formal methods is called model checking. Um, where the, system, the model checking system will construct a, a model of the program's behavior. And by running the program against that model, we'll try to explore all the possible program states and guarantee that the undesirable states are never reached. And there are a great variety of model checkers around. Um, rather than trying to exhaustively enumerate all the states of a large program, they're often symbolic and therefore use quite compact representations of the program. We can formalize stochastic behavior, uh, real-time behavior, hybrid behavior, distributed systems, and so on. Uh, there are a lot of different modeling languages and a lot of different property uh, logics. So uh, some well-known examples, Blow, Blast, Spin, Prism, TLA+. Plus. Uh, another approach to formal methods was called abstract interpretation. And in this setting, it's, the idea is that we're not going to run the program as it is, but we are going to use some coarser data type than the data types in the program as written. So for example, if my program requires an integer, I could use a smaller data type, which has only the values 0, 1, and minus 1. 
and I can write down what's the logic, sorry, what's the different ar arithmetic on those values. And using this, this rough approximation, I'm able to check this, uh, this um, coarse-grained version of the program for correctness. And the idea is this will be a sound approximation so that when I discover an error in the coarse-grained program, that error is also present in the original program. But of course, the other way around is not always true. And probably the heaviest technique in this arsenal is the approach of theorem proving, where we use uh, a computerized proof, maybe not fully automatic, but a mechanized proof nonetheless, that proves in some logic that the desired property holds. So probably the most famous logic is Hoare logic, which is based on the idea that every um, statement of your program has a precondition and a postcondition. And what you have to do is to prove that if the precondition holds, then the postcondition holds. A more modern uh, program logic is separation logic, which in particular is used for reasoning about the layout of objects in the heap. So sometimes these kind of automated theorem proving approach to formal verification can be fully automated, or sometimes it must be fully manual with the, the programmer or the, the mathematician writing out the proof entirely by hand, and many in-between possibilities exist. So in terms of theorem provers which have been used to verify software, um, the new hot thing would be infer from Facebook. Uh, Cock has been around for a long time and is widely used. Hall Light is often used in the verification of hardware as well as software. And Isabel is another well known theorem prover. Now, formal methods do have some drawbacks. So, as I mentioned earlier, they don't necessarily work very well with commonly used languages. Thanks to the halting problem, many of the most interesting properties we'd like to address are actually undecidable in the general case. And even when they are decidable, they can be very computationally expensive to do. And in particular, if we like to have very strong formal guarantees using theorem prover, sorry, using theorem proving, it can require uh, a lot of effort from the human prover to produce the proofs of correctness of the program. Uh, and so the effort in proving the soundness, or sorry, the correctness of the program will often be greatly vast, greatly larger than the effort to write the program in the first place. And the high cost of it means that it's very rarely worth doing. Um, so how do we translate those kinds of questions into the world of quantum software? So if we think of a piece of quantum software, not, not the whole thing, but just the core element in a quantum program would be the circuit. So in this case, as before, if you're thinking about testing a circuit, we have some input state psi, we have some output state phi, and I'd like to, you know, my claim is that if I run my program on psi, then phi will be the output. And the first question is, how would I even test that? the unlike in the classical world we can't just look at our quantum states so we either have to choose some some weaker idea that phi will be good enough if it pass if it has similar measurement statistics on some restricted set of measurements or we're going to have to pay a very high overhead to do complete tomography which will be very expensive we could attempt to verify these kinds of equations in simulation, but of course, the whole reason that we have quantum computing is because these things are very expensive to simulate. So if we were really interested in running this program, it's unlikely to be small enough that we can cheaply simulate it. And if we take a further step back and look at examples of real quantum software, um, it may not be obvious to you in this code, and it doesn't really matter what the code is, but this is Python. Uh, this is Python using the, the PyTicket library. And I can write any Python here. 
So if I want to verify the correctness of my quantum software, as it is today, then I have to also include the entire classical problem of verification. So that's why I think it is probably more appropriate for most um, of the techniques being developed in formal verification to restrict themselves to circuits. Because we have good mathematical models of quantum circuits, we don't need to invent anything new. Um, and equivalence of circuits is at least decidable. Um, however, it is QMA complete. So in the worst case, it would be computationally infeasible to do. But the larger part of what I want to talk about today is all about trying to prove the equivalence of circuits. So I just want to briefly mention a few things that I won't talk about today. So this whole area of quantum formal methods has really accelerated in the last few years after a long time of not really going anywhere. Um, so I'm going to mention a few things which are worth your time to investigate further. The um, first thing is looking at types and the programming languages which underlie these type systems. So in particular, the oldest and probably uh, most widely known uh, typed quantum programming language is Quipper and its descendants made by Peter Selinger and many collaborators of him. The most recent version of it is called Proto Quipper D, which is a system which has linear dependent types, which is a very sophisticated type system, uh, which can prove many programs, sorry, can prove many properties of its programs. A more basic system would be Choir from Anne Pekin and Stan, Stanjevich. Uh, which is all about wires. And there is a, quite a large number of different uh, lambda calculus derived systems, going back to some early work from Rigi and Dweck, uh, more recent work on that direction from Valiron and Diaz Carroll and several other people who I just didn't write down on the slide. Apologies if I have omitted you from the list. On the sides of abstract interpretation and model checking, of course, the, uh, I think the earliest paper on abstract interpretation in quantum computing is by our dear host, uh, Simon Perdry, who's written about entanglement analysis using abstract interpretation back in 2008. And these ideas um, more recently surfacing in the work of Rand and collaborators on Gorosman types, although they claim to be types, I, if you read what they are actually doing, they are more like abstract interpretations or, or symbolic simulations of the, of the circuits. Um, it's not strictly model checking, but there is a, a very interesting recent tool produced by the group at uh, Johannes Kepler University. This paper I'm citing here by Buchholzer and Wille is just one of many good papers from this group. Uh, and although the circuit equivalence problem is QMA complete. Um, in practice, quantum circuits actually have structure, which means you rarely fall into the worst cases. And this tool will allow you to verify whether or not two circuits are equivalent. And usually, you will not uh, run out of memory. Moving on to the world of logics and theorem proving, there's a lot more work I could have cited here, but I haven't got the time or the space to put it in. So uh, Mingsheng Ying has been one of the most active people in this area for a long time. He was one of the early movers on Hoare logic for quantum programs, a subject which has been more recently taken up by Dominique Unra. Um, there is a very nice piece of work called VOQC or VOX, I think they pronounce it, um, from Hitala and al, uh, looking at different circuit optimization techniques, which they have proved correct in COC. And this is a particularly interesting area from my perspective because the main thing which an optimizing compiler does is transform one circuit into another circuit, and it had better be equivalent to the circuit you started from, otherwise you're not, um, you're not really helping anything. 
some recent work looking at generalizing separation logic to the quantum case, and then uh, a brand new system for formal verification of quantum software called Kubrix. And I just realized that, that uh, the name should be Charlton and not Charlton. I'm going to blame autocorrect for that error. Apologies for that one. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about any of those things today. Um, uh, but I am going to talk a little bit about what does quantum software actually look like? Or rather, what does quantum software look like in 2021? Because if we're going to think about how to formally verify something, we'd better understand what we're talking about in the first place and where there might be some advantage in formally verifying it. So the first question is, what does quantum software look like? And this is, this is you looking into your fridge where your program is running and uh, what's happening inside the fridge. Well, we can take a look inside and we see there's going to be some quantum circuit going on in there. And, you know, big disclaimer, what's actually happening there does not really resemble this picture at all. There's a whole other layer of abstraction between us and that, but we're not going to cross that barrier today. Um, but the important thing to notice is that some states are prepared at the beginning, some gates are applied, and then some measurements take place. And each of the measurements will produce one bit of information. And as everyone here knows, this process is stochastic. So if I do it again, I won't get the same bits necessarily, and so on. So I repeat this many times. So what I'm getting here is not a definite answer to a, to a single question, but rather I'm getting an expectation can average over all the possible outputs of those measurements. And in a slightly more realistic um, example than this, the circuit could be quite a lot bigger. But the general form of such a thing is always like this. There will be some known initial state which is prepared. Uh, then the circuit, which is usually called an ansatz, is put in place to create the quantum state which we're interested in, and then we perform some measurement on the state. And what we're interested in is the expectation of, of that, which is given by the um, Dirac product at the bottom there. So in terms of, of what's going on, we, we have to remember that the quantum computer is always kind of a hybrid system. So we have the user on one side, with the classical computer sending messages to the quantum device and the things which are the concern of classical computing of your python program or your equipper program or whatever you're using are basically saying what state do i want to make what property of that state do i want to measure and once i've got the measurement results how do i want to process those and the Quantum aspects of what's going on are almost entirely contained within this question of what state is being prepared. So let's go into a little bit more detail about what that looks like. So here's a real example. Um, at CQC, we basically believe that the first useful thing that quantum computers are going to do is going to be in the world of chemistry or material science. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how to compute different properties of molecules and condensed matter systems. And so finding the ground state energy of some system is more or less the most basic task there is. Uh, and so what is the ground state energy of a system? Given a Hamiltonian, which describes the physics of the system we're looking at, we need to find its uh, lowest eigenvalue. And the corresponding eigenstate the eigenvalue is the ground state. So this is, of course, a totally normal everyday problem in physics and chemistry, but there's quite a lot of other optimization problems which can be cast into this form as well. So it's quite a, a good universal problem. Okay, so this is the big picture. Um, let's zoom in a little bit closer and see what does the Hamiltonian look like. And so Typically, it looks like this. So this is what's called the second quantized form. So this is now qubits rather than some uh, uh, other op arbitrary operators. So the indices here are the indices of the qubits, which will be in my computer. And we can see that the Hamiltonian 
consists of a sum of pile operators, a linear combination of, of pile operators. Um, so we'd like to be able to estimate H, and the way that we'll do it is by using the fact that the expectation is linear, and then we can measure each of those pile operators separately. Uh, and then at the end, we can combine the expectations uh, according to this formula, which is on the screen. Okay, so how do we find the ground state? That's what we need to do in order to find the, the energy. Um, so we need to minimize the energy over all the states. And that is asking quite a lot uh, in general. So the usual approach is to choose what's called a parameterized ansatz. And rather than um, trying to exhaustively search over every conceivable quantum state, we have some parameterized family of states. And by varying the parameters, we try to find the minimum among those states. And the assumption is that this will be close enough to the current state, that it doesn't matter. And a parameterized ansatz, as you will have guessed, is basically a parameterized circuit. And in this example, you can see the alpha and the beta um, positions highlighted in the circuit here, which shows where the parameters um, appear in the circuit. The design of good parameterized ansatz is a major research topic in the field, and I won't have anything to say about that today, but there's no particular um, magic structure that these things always have. So if you find a, a good one, then uh, publish quickly. So once we've got this parameterized circuit, um, we put it all together in one of the most well-known quantum algorithms, the variational quantum eigensolver. And this is a pretty simple algorithm. The idea is that I have my ansatz, I have the big list of terms from my Hamiltonian, so I will repeatedly prepare the ansatz state, measure it many times with each of the measurements from my Hamiltonian, I will feed those statistics into a classical computer, I'll compute the energy, then I will use a classical optimizer, which I call here update, um, to find a new value for the vector of parameters. So in order to, the next time I go around the loop, my estimate for the energy will be below what I had before. And we'll keep going around the loop in this way until the value of E converges to something. And we'll typically then assume that's the ground state. Okay, so, like if we kind of zoom out a little bit, we can see that we've got the inner loop is to say, I want to estimate one term of the Hamiltonian. So I'm going to, I'm going to run the ansatz with fixed parameters, a single measurement, a whole bunch of times to get some statistics. But actually, I'm going to do that for every term of the Hamiltonian. And then once I've got an estimate for every term, I can actually compute the energy. Uh, but if I haven't converged yet, then I'm going to update my ASS parameters and repeat that loop. And often in these problems, we're not just looking at a single configuration of the molecule. We're probably scanning over the geometry of this of this object to try and find where is the like uh, large scale configuration that is most energetically prone to settle into. Okay, so that's a rough structure of what is going on in a very, very simple but realistic experiment. Um, and you can see that there's quantum parts, uh, classical parts, which are interacting. And in fact, if one stares at these things a little bit, you can see that these kinds of experiments are quite highly structured and there's re relatively few things which can happen, which leads me on to my first real point today, which is to talk about types for quantum experiments. So what I mean, when I'm talking about types here, I'm talking about things at the level we just talked about. So experiments which are made out of many circuits which are being evaluated, some of them in, could be in parallel, some of them are requiring information from other circuits. So we're not really thinking too much about this, how the circuits are generated. So at this level of discussion, qubits are not really a useful type. It's, it's really just a a measure of whether your circuit will fit in your computer at all, rather than we're generating circuits here. On the other hand, distributions will be a very important type. 
So let's quickly run through some of the basic types that we want to talk about. So this will be familiar to pretty much anyone who's done any functional programming um, and probably not very difficult, even if you haven't. So the simplest type we can think of is the type which has only one member, which is called unit type. Uh, we may then also have the very useful type of bits, of which there's a zero and a one, and bit strings of length n. Since we're dealing a lot of the time with um, trying to describe quantum states with continuous parameters or probabilities, it's very useful to have real numbers, even though in practice they're often just represented by double precision numbers. And again, we want to have real vectors of size n, and likewise, complex numbers. Complex numbers really only show up for us in um, simulations, um, but they do show up. So these we think of as the ground types, even though it's possible to construct the, the vectors and the bit strings um, from combinators. So some simple combinators that we'll have is the star, which is the Cartesian product. So A star B is the type of pairs with an A and a B. A arrow B is the type of functions, which take A's as inputs and produce B's as outputs. And list A is type of lists of any length, including empty, which have elements all of the same type being A. Uh, it's not too hard to guess that you will also have a lot of sort of standard functions which manipulate these types. I think it's not really worth explaining these right now, so I'll just move on. But as I promised earlier, a key type for us is going to be distributions, which I'll denote dist A. So dist A is the type of finitely supported distributions, uh, which you can think of as functions which take in A's and produce real numbers subject to a few provisos. So first of all, the value of the distribution on any element of A must be between zero and one. And because it's finitely supported, only finitely many of the members of this type can have a non-zero uh, value with the distribution. And if we sum up all those non-zero ones, then the, um, the sum is one. So this is what it means to be a distribution. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Oh, I didn't say it, but it's written there. Of course, we're talking about real probability distributions, not complex amplitudes. So they all have to be strictly positive. Um, it is worth noting that um, dist, as I described here, is a functor. So if I have any function from A to B, I can lift that function to a map between distributions by just um, taking whatever probability A gets in the, the distribution on the left, and then the image of A gets that probability um, in B. Of course, list is also a functor, so we can do the same trick with lists. I'll let you work that out for yourself. I'm not going to go too much into the full categorical details of what functors are all about today. Um, so there's a bit more to it than just this, but none of it's going to be important for us. Uh, okay, so as well as being a functor, dist is also a monad. So I'm always able to make a point distribution from an element of A. So that would be the distribution that assigns probability 1 to the chosen element and 0 to everything else. And if I've got a distribution of distributions, I can always integrate that down to just be a distribution over the original set. Okay, so that can be quite handy for a number of things. Uh, right. Oh, again, like as before, lists also a monad, but we don't call the maps point and integrate. Uh, I'll let you guess what the list ones are if you don't know. So for the purpose of designing experiments for Nisky machines, we're going to be talking about distributions or bit strings of length n pretty much all the time. So I'm going to introduce this curly D, so superscript N, to denote distributions of bit strings of length N. Uh, OK. So that's the kind of very simple types. And 
we're going to need something slightly more interesting to get us off the ground here, and that's the type of circuits. And I'll write circ of mn to denote the type of circuits with m qubits as inputs and n qubits as outputs. And the most useful thing that I can do with circuits is compose them. So I've got this operation which I'm calling seek for sequent or sequential composition. Um, so if I have two circuits and one of them has k outputs and the other one has k inputs, I can wire the inputs to the outputs to produce a new circuit. And within the class of circuits, there are some particularly useful ones, namely the ansets of circuits, which don't take any inputs. So as before, we can just assume that their, their initial state is just prepared in some known state. The measurement circuits, they have inputs, but they have no outputs because every qubit would be measured. And what we would get by composing uh, uh, an ansatz with a measurement would be a complete circuit. So there's no inputs and no outputs. Uh, and that would be, so I'm going to call that one curly C, and that's equivalent to circ 0, 0. And you can see how that fits into our earlier picture. So the state preparation part of our, uh, of our computation is one of these ansatz circuits. The, the measurement at the end is indeed a measurement. And if we compose them together, I get this complete circuit, which will, of course, just be generating results for me. And if I take a thing like this over to my quantum computer, then I can see that I'm sending over uh, an element of type C, which is my, my circuit to be evaluated. And what I'm getting back from this quantum device is a list of bit strings. And I'm going to formalize this interaction by saying that any, any reasonable system for computing these kinds of algorithms should have a thing called execute, which will be specific to a given machine. And there's lots of little details I'm suppressing here. But there should be a way to send a circuit which has no inputs and measures all of its qubits and gets back the results. And it's kind of obvious that if I have such an execute, uh, map. If I've got a list of bit strings, just by counting, I can turn that into a distribution over bit strings. So that two dist is effectively a, a coercion into a more useful type than this list. Um, similarly, I don't actually have to run my don't have to run my circuit on a real machine. I can run it on a state vector simulator, which will be computationally expensive, but rather than producing me it's the list of outcomes, I could actually have a representation of the final state vector in memory. Potentially very large, but yeah, I just realized that n should be 2 to the n, but you know, that's, that's OK. Um, but again, if I have that state vector in memory, I can just read out its amplitudes from the state vector to get a distribution. In this case, the distribution would correspond to just measuring the state in standard basis. If I wanted some other basis, then I could easily accommodate that as well. OK, so I've got my, my basic components going on here. Let's go back to the Hamiltonian. So h, the estimate of h is my quantity of interest. And you can see by looking at the expression that this Hamiltonian is basically defined by uh, a list of pairs. And each pair consists of a measurement operation, one of those Paulis, either a single Pauli or a pair of Paulis. And in principle, it could be any number of Paulis. And each one of them has a coefficient associated with it. And if I have that information, I have enough to reconstruct the Hamiltonian. Um, now, what I actually want to know is h. So I also need to know the arithmetic structure of what this is. So it's a particularly easy one because I just, you know, multiply every um, result by its coefficient and add them up. A priori, it could be something more complicated. But, so I'm going to formalize this idea of an observable quantity as being a list, sorry, as being a function 
which takes a list of measurements and um, results which go with those measurements and combines this whole list together to make a real number. So in the, the example up here, it would be very easy to see how that would work. I would just start, I would start with my Hamiltonian and when the, when the two uh, measurement terms match, I would take the, the average of the distribution, multiply it by the coefficient and add it onto the running total until I've computed the whole thing. Okay, and so that's an independent part of the problem. And the other independent part of the problem is the variational ansatz. So standard ansatz is just a circuit with no inputs, but variational ansatz is actually something more complicated, which is to say it's a function from its k real parameters to such a circuit. In principle, the parameters don't have to be real, but uh, they are in all the examples that I know. And in order to get an actual circuit from this variational ansatz, we also need a vector of parameters to, to plug in there. And this, um, this number k will be independent, usually of everything else that we've seen so far. And so if I have all these things, then I can construct the variational quantum eigensolver. So you can see it's kind of in two parts. So the data that I'm going to provide in my parameters, my variational ansatz, the Hamiltonian, how do I compute the observable given the Hamiltonian, this classical function called update, which is this one here. And another condition that wasn't really shown explicitly here called stop which tells us when we've finished. And given this input data, it's pretty easy to construct the, the rest of the algorithm using sequential composition, using the execution map, and using this coercion from lists of bit strings to distributions, just using standard list manipulation functions and composition. And it's like three lines to write this down in OCaml once you have all that stuff. Um, okay, I yeah, I'll move on. I guess I could try to explain a few, a few more interesting things that you can define easily this way. But most, many, many interesting things can now be defined uh, quite simply. So, for example, marginalization of the results can be defined just by saying which of the outcomes you want to forget about. In the, um, in the list of bit strings. And then the lifting of this classical function to the distribution monad will give you the marginalization for free. If I wanted to do post selection, I could do a similar thing. Again, it's just a classical function on the outcomes and then it lifts monadically, or sorry, it lifts functorially to the um, distributions. Um, okay. So um, I did mention at the beginning, I didn't expand on it yet, what is meant by this term NISC. So it's an abbreviation uh, for noisy intermediate scale quantum. Apologies for those who know this already. I wasn't really sure if everyone would. Um, so it's a term introduced a few years ago by John Preskill. Uh, it's been extremely influential in the field. And I want to unpack a little bit some of the implications of this. The first part is, what does he mean intermediate scale? And this is roughly speaking where we are today with the leading edge of quantum computing. So 50 to 100 qubits. And that's enough qubits that it would be quite difficult to simulate that system. But it's not enough for um, error correction codes to be deployed, at least not to have enough useful qubits left over to do any work with if you would apply an error correction code there. And since we can't do error correction, then we have to live with the other part of the acronym, which is noisy. And noisy can basically be summarized as everything is terrible. So the, um, the qubits don't live very long. Uh, the fidelity of every operation is finite. Um, the error is not constant across the machine, they're not constant across time, the errors interact with each other, and sometimes we just don't even know what's going on. So 
the this is what we, the real problem we have to deal with at the moment rather than worrying too much about um, programmer errors it's the fact that these machines are extremely noisy and we have to suppress the noise in order to get anything out of it and the the compositional approach that i was explaining earlier is actually quite an important um, tool in achieving that and i'm going to come to that in a moment so it's worth remarking that if i have noise i have finite um, computational power because if I even if I incur quite a small noise on every operation that means that my fidelity is exponentially declining in the number of operations so I'm going to run out it doesn't matter how many qubits I actually have I'm still going to have a bound on how much work I can do because of the noise uh, the second point which I hope came through clearly in the earlier discussion is that everything we're doing here is statistical um, so that gives us a bit of wiggle room to try and work with the noise because at the end of the day we don't need to produce a pristine quantum state to do something else we just need to get statistics which are accurate for our problem so in this way we can try to hide the inevitable errors in the statistics or suppress them statistically when they do happen but it's not um, it's not the case that hardware is going to do this on its own we need to have the entire um, software stack working together to do this which is why compositionality is so important here um, it is also worth saying that a lot of the algorithms that you will read in the classic textbooks like nielsen and Twang, and a lot of the kind of more forward-thinking algorithms you might hear about from people working in quantum machine learning they're just not possible in this regime you don't have enough um, circuit depth available to you to do those kinds of algorithms. So that really restricts us to things like the, the variational algorithms that I, I gave an example of earlier. And with that, let's move on to composable error mitigation. Now, I don't have as many type annotations as I would like to have had but I hope it will be clear if I just explain things verbally, what I'm talking about here. So this is our picture of our variational quantum algorithm. And now we know that everything happening in this blue area is going to be afflicted, sorry, blue area is going to be afflicted by noise. And we also know that we have a bit of wiggle room in this orange box to try and address that. So what are some things that we could do? We could change the circuit in order to make the, the circuit we're running a bit more resilient to noise. So you can think of that as a transformation from circuit to circuit. Um, we can change the collection of measurements that we do, which means that when I get my list of measurements, and my list of coefficients from my Hamiltonian or my, my, um, my function that maps the output distributions to the final observed quantity, I could transform those I need to transform both of them uh, in order to measure a different set of things and compute the observed quantity differently. Um, but I may be able to do that in a way that suppresses noise. Of course, I can change the computation of E, which you can think of as just being a mapping from distribution to distribution before the data hits that computation. And is it really necessary that I um, run the circuits as the, the algorithm asked. Uh, in fact, some of our, our most successful techniques suggest that we should actually replace the, uh, this, any single circuit with a whole number of a batch of circuits and then reassemble the statistics at the end. Uh, so we'll, we'll explain very briefly what some of those things are. Okay, so here's my, my quantum computer operator. Uh, getting ready for some some work today and in order to make this system a bit more painless we're going to modify the uh, the picture here by shoving a database in the middle so that is not terribly important but for practical reasons it is very useful and that now means that we've got a layer of indirection between the circuits and the results so there's this collection of handles which will be used to refer to the, the results. 
Uh, and so otherwise things are the same. And we might want to actually add some, some compilation to our uh, circuits before we send them to the machine. Since we've spent a lot of time making a circuit compiler, which is quite good, we might want to use that. And so this in this setting, I would have my circuit compiler uh, before the circuits are sent to the database. And so each, although it's not indicated here, each of these ports is carrying a type and that shows what's allowed to travel along it. OK, so this is a plain old um, non-noise mitigated computation. So the first um, noise mitigation approach we're going to talk about is called frame randomization. So the idea here is to make things more manageable by making them more random. As I mentioned earlier, the noise we see in quantum devices, in particular superconducting devices, is quite complex and non-Markovian, and things interact in quite strange ways. And if you add enough random Pauli operations to your circuit, then this badly behaved noise in, in, the, in the statistics becomes uh, equivalent to a Pauli channel, which is far easier to deal with. So what randomized compiling does is it takes the original circuit that you wanted to run and it makes a whole batch of modified versions with Paulis added to them randomly. Um, it is possible to compute the effect that these Pauli guide, that these uh, additional Paulis will have on the final results. And so you can think of it as a transformation, which uh, first of all generates a, a new batch of circuits instead of the ones that you asked for, and then evaluates them all. And then having got them all, transforms the results before adding them all back together again and returning them. OK, so that you can think of that effectively as being a circuit to circuit list transformation and then the results list to results transformation at the end. That's pretty clean. Now, the next thing we might want to think about is the spam correction. So spam is an abbreviation for state preparation and measurement. And basically, this refers to the situation when you prepared a known, you think you prepared a known state, and then you measured it, but you don't see the answer you ought to see. Most commonly, you think you're in the one state, but the measurement says you're zero. Um, this happens with a few pro, a few percentage points on most current machines. So there is a way to avoid this, though, which is to do a, a rather lengthy and experiment, expensive experiment beforehand to work out the what's called the spam matrix, which describes the the probability of seeing a given error. That is, the probability of seeing a one when you should have seen a zero, or vice versa. And once you have this matrix, you can use it as a trans you can invert it and use it to transform the results that you get. And so that looks a bit like this. So I had my original request and I want to add spam correction to my circuit. Here's my original circuit here. And that you can see that's just going to run as before, but it's wrapped up in this spam correction uh, gadget, which first of all, creates the spam calibration experiment to compute what the spam matrix is. And then once the results are in, it effectively multiplies this distribution by the inverse of the spam matrix to um, reverse the effect of spam errors at the level of distributions. Excuse, excuse me, Ross. Yeah. There is a question in the chat of uh, Omar. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I it's a, so he asked about a, a few, few slides ago about the psi t. He asked uh, to get a, to get an order, an idea, an idea of 
orders of magnitude, how large is psi t? Are you thinking of it as 50, uh, 50 or 100 qubits? And how many measurements do you perform? For each measurement, how many times are they repeated? Aha, uh -huh. okay, so the size of um, the ansatz state psi depends greatly on the on the size of the system you would like to study. Uh, so the chemists employ a great deal of cleverness to try and make it as small as possible. So the smallest one uh, one would ever see is a single qubit, which is very dull. Um, I would just study more interesting molecules like um, caffeine or femoco. We would be looking at in the low hundreds of qubits for a system of that size. Uh, so in the experiments that we're doing just now, we're usually thinking of molecules which require in low tens of qubits to represent. Now, how many measurements there are can be vast. That's, that's really the whole game of this, is to actually reduce the number of measurements rather than to reduce the number of qubits required. Um, okay. I don't have a number on the top of my head to tell you, but I would think if you square the number of qubits, then you're probably not close yet. There is another question about uh, the computation of the spam matrix. Uh, Alexandra, Alexandra asks if um, it is a classical calculation. Yes, it's a classical calculation, and it's also not very scalable. So, in fact, uh, the cost of computing the spam matrix will be exponential in the number of qubits. So, an ongoing research project is to try and find what we call sparse spam so that we do not need to do as quite as many experiments as that um, but it is a classical um, uh, matrix which we have to store in memory and we have to invert so that you can you can guess the problems that come with that is there any more questions no for now you you can continue i guess um, okay so that was spam and uh, that's what it looks like. But of course, I this is composable, right? So I can do them both. So here is, I'm going to do spam correction with frame randomization. So this is the experiment that I had before, which you know it has the same type as the original experiment. So I can just plug it into my spam uh, gadget and the spam gadget doesn't know any better than if it was just doing a single experiment. Uh, and so that's the lovely thing about having nice types which are well behaved. I'm going to do one more example of this, of something which is, I think, quite well known, uh, but it's also kind of cool, uh, which is called zero noise extrapolation. And this is based on the observation that most um, qubits have a finite lifespan. And the longer that they hang around, the more decoherence sets in and the less likely you are to have any usable data. And the idea of zero noise extrapolation is that since we can't really subtract the noise, if we just add more noise, then we could just curve fit on the results and um, predict what we would have got if we had seen zero noise. And the simplest way of doing this is to repeat gates, or what they call folding the gates. So if I am doing a certain gate, then instead of just doing it once, I'll do, let's call it G, I'll do gate G, G inverse G, and that's been folded once. Or I can fold it twice, and I go G, G inverse G, G inverse G, and so on. And by making the circuit longer in this way, we can add noise to it in a fairly controlled manner. And so you can see this plot here is the idea, if I just done yeah, uh, the best experiment I can manage, I would have got this single data point. Uh, however, if I do all these other like crappy experiments, which see much more noise, then I get a rather nice curve. And if I just fit the curve, I can predict that at the zero noise limit, I would have had this value for my experimental quantity, which I don't know what it is on this chart actually, but. Um, and in practice, although this seems extremely shonky, that works pretty well. So in terms of our, um, our system, then we have something which looks a bit like this. So the, um, 
the spam uh, setup is coming in, and when it gets the, the the circuit on the input, it's actually just going to duplicate it. In this case, eight times. And then we have this. Um, I think that might be wrong, but the the results of all the experiments are collated. And in each case, I'm doing the complete experiment, right? So I'm computing everything down to the expectation value at the end. And then at the end, I'm putting all these things together to um, interpolate towards the, sorry, to extrapolate what I would have seen at the zero noise. Now, you may have guessed from these pictures that this is something which exists or which nearly exists. So uh, I'm, Hopeful that this will be available to the public in the next few weeks, certainly by midsummer. It's a new package we've made called Kermit. It's for error mitigation. Uh, oh, it includes the methods I've just talked about and quite a few more. And there will be a paper about it a bit later this year. Um, so keep your eyes open for that. Okay. How am I doing for time? Let's look at that more than an hour. Great. So, what do we know so far? This uh, adding types to the story is quite useful because it lets us build these more complicated experiments in a way that makes it easy to build things out of smaller pieces. And having simplified interfaces in this way does reduce the chance of error. But we're still just doing classical programming at this point. So it's, uh, it's a nice Python library. That's exactly what Kermit is. Um, and we're not saying anything at all about the quantum state. So what? can we say about the quantum state, since that's the, uh, perhaps the interesting thing in quantum formal methods. I'm going to start with something which is not really a formal method, but which gets the kind of toe in the door, which is the idea of assertions. Uh, so in the classical world, assertions basically amounts to the programmer making a claim about the state of the program. And in particular, this claim should be true, otherwise the program won't execute correctly. And if you add assertions to your program, they will be checked at runtime. And if the assertion isn't true, the program should terminate with an error. Uh, and in this way, you find a bug. So you can see in my, my silly little C example here that I put in two assertions that basically bounce check this array. And if I try to use an array index which is past the end of the array, then that would fail the assertions. OK, so that is the idea. Can we generalize this to the quantum setting? So if we're talking, and over here, we're talking about the state, right? So the, it's always about what's the contents of the variables. So in the quantum case, it must also be about the state. And the only things that a quantum state, the only questions that a quantum state can answer are questions about subspaces. Which subspace of the Hilbert space is it in? And subspaces are defined by projection operators. And this is the core idea of the original logic of quantum mechanics from 1936 by Birkhoff and von Neumann. And the idea was we'll make a logic where the propositions in the logic are projection operators, which is say closed subspaces of a Hilbert space. So if my proposition A corresponds to a certain subspace, then its negation would then be the orthogonal subspace. And this gives a very clean uh, binary logic. So we try to take this idea into quantum computing. Um, it works pretty well. So I can make a claim about the quantum state by saying I believe that the state lies in this particular subset, uh, substate, subspace. Sorry, I'm losing my ability to speak. Uh, and I can check this at runtime. If the state does happen to lie in that subspace, it will be unmodified by this projected measurement. And if it does not, then the the error will be detected and we can abort the program. Okay, so that basically corresponds, if I have my assertion of A, where A is some, some, some claim, that basically says that 
the current state lies in the plus one eigenstate of a certain measurement operator. Um, this is not a particularly original idea. I learned about it from this paper. Uh, Gushu Lee gave a very nice talk last year at the Quantum Compilers Workshop. And this much of what you're about to see is borrowed from this, this paper here. So in particular, you might have an assertion like the following. Uh, the current state is in A2. Now, A2 is going to be a projection operator. And in particular, A2 is going to be this one here, which is a very boring kind of projection operator because it's just picking out one particular state. Um, so if we wanted to try to use this, how would that look? So here is a little circuit corresponding to a subroutine in Shor's algorithm. And here's how it would look in, in Python if we wrote it in PyTicket. If I want to make this assertion that A2 is happening at this location in the circuit, then I will, what I expect to happen is to have something happening here to check this claim. So this comment is going to soon be replaced with a whole bunch of code. Wah, there it is. Um, and what you see here is a description of this uh, state, as it is, in terms of Pauli operators. Now, you can see the structure of the state is that it's actually a GZ state, tensor product with the, the plus plus state. And so my, my projector then is going to be, one of them is the GZ projector, or one of them is the, um, the plus plus state. And you can see in the syntax here that I am defining the subspace in terms of its um, Pauli stabilizers. So this is a uh, still work in progress feature in PyTicket, so it's not available yet. It will probably change before it is available. But at this point, once I added this, the instruction to assert this, this, this um, projector, which I've just constructed, then the compiler can go ahead and build a suitable mid-circuit measurement in order to perform that assertion. And if the um, correct output is seen at the classical output, then we will continue on the execution of the program, otherwise we'll abort. Um, it is, there's lots of recipes which describe how to make suitable um, circuits for all kinds of projections. However, it's a bit difficult to make non-trivial assertions about um, real circuits. So as I mentioned earlier, the chemists try very hard to make their circuits small. So while it's pretty reasonable to think that if I'm studying a certain molecule, it has symmetry that um, means that certain states shouldn't be allowed, and those do tend to correspond to subspaces where the correct state should not be found, if we already know about such a thing, the chemists have probably found a way to optimize that redundancy out of existence. And so appealing to our knowledge of the, uh, the ansatz to find non-trivial assertions is pretty difficult. Um, also, most, or maybe not most, but many properties of interest don't correspond to subspaces. I mean, I can't say, oh, please project me into the subspace where all the states are entangled. Um, because that's not a subspace. Uh, the original use of this, um, the original proposal for quantum assertions was actually for debugging quantum programs. But as we know, that's not the real issue here. The real issue is error mitigation. And they can be used for that, and they're actually reasonably effective at that, though not as effective as, as some other measures. Partly because we're doing an additional measurement in the circuit in the middle, uh, which can actually be fairly expensive in terms of introducing additional noise. So let's um, let's take a little step back from, from that before we, we go on too further. So the original quantum logic from Burkhoff and von Neumann was trying to take seriously the limitations of knowledge that we get from quantum mechanics, where the strange um, feature of complementarity of different observables not being defined at the well at the same time. 
and also to try and give a more more logical basis to build quantum theory on. And their logic doesn't really have proofs. It's a what what Girard would call a Tarskian logic, and that's based on the propositions, and there's no proofs. So, for example, a valid proposition would be, is the spin up? And then I have a, a nice measurement that I can do to measure the spin, and it'll tell me if the spin is up or not. So I've got um, an eigenspace for that measurement operator. And then the, the lattice of propositions is the collection of the closed subspaces of the Hilbert space ordered under inclusion. And we're making a, a simplifying assumption here that every, every subspace, every closed subspace is a valid proposition. And as a lattice, I mean, many logics are formalized as lattices. But as a lattice, this is kind of weird because projectors don't commute and in general and that means that the lattice is not distributive so if you look at this example if my propositions are a and b then you can see that if i take the intersection of a and b and the intersection of not a and b and i take the union of those two things then the only point that i get is the zero point However, if I use my distributive law and I pull that B out to the right-hand side, then the union of A and A perp is the whole space intersect with B is just B. So the distributive law fails, and this is not very nice logic. There is a weaker thing, orthomodularity, which I won't discuss, but these kinds of lattices are called orthomodular lattices because they have that property. Um, and it does get a little bit worse because if there is a connective, which we'll call implication, uh, which is adjoint to the conjunction, then necessarily the lattice is distributive. And that means that this, the original von Birkhoff and Norman quantum logic doesn't have modus ponens. So you can't actually do deduction internally in the logic. Um, and if you take any any set of commuting projectors, so this problem distributivity goes away, then it's just a Boolean lattice. So there isn't really anything interesting to be found there. And it gets worse because you can't even make a tensor product of these things. So it seems that this um, this quantum logic, although it's good for its very limited range of things, which is basically about projectors, it's not a particularly good candidate for thinking about interesting properties of quantum computations. And I'm going much slower than I expected to be going, so I'm going to skip a few slides here. Um, so some things have happened. Uh, some people have done some things. That was all very good. Um, let's move on. And yeah, let's move on from there as well. So what really we quite like to do is to set up a nice triangle like this. This is the, uh, what I would call the curry howard Lambeck correspondence. And the idea here is I've got some, some logic which corresponds to some reasoning system that I have. I have a rewriting system which captures some notion of computation in my world. And I have some categorical structure which gives me a denotational semantics. So the most classic example of this is if I take the intuitionistic logic and the simply type lambda calculus, that's the curry howard correspondence, and they are equivalent as mathematical objects, and the corresponding categorical thing, given the denotational semantics, is the Cartesian closed categories. So what should we have in the quantum version? So we want entanglement to be there, so we can't use um, a Cartesian product as a way of combining systems. Uh, because we have the phenomena of teleportation and the Joy Janikowski isomorphism, uh, we should have something which is like a function type. Um, because we have no cloning, no deleting, we should have something linear, uh, but we still need some way to talk about non determinism. And there is a very interesting line if you 
if you've read um, Bennett's 93 paper, saying that you should not think of um, entangled pairs as a directed channel, but undirected channel between sender and receiver. And if you've studied multiplicative linear logic, this will probably be very suggestive of the par connective in classical multiplicative linear logic. So is it possible that we could build a logic for quantum states based on that? And we want to do more than just like have channels, right? We have complicated entangled states which can serve as universal models of computation. So what can we do? So in the normal model of MLL in Hilbert spaces, the tensor product connective from linear logic and the par connective of linear logic get identified, turn to be the same thing. Now we can do a categorical construction on this to make a more complicated object, which is called double gluing, but we don't get the entanglement back out. We get the, the tensor product corresponding to the product of state spaces, so only separable states, and the par being all the states. So instead of getting a nice dichotomy between entangled and separable, we get the inclusion of the separable states in the, uh, the type of par, which is not really what we wanted. We can also ask um, a little bit more, like how many types is it even reasonable to have if we would like different kinds of entanglement to be different types? And a fairly standard definition is to think about what's called the SLOC classes. So SLOC is an abbreviation for stochastic local operations and classical communications. And a state S is SLOC reachable from another state S prime. If there is some sequence of those operations that allows me to transform one state into the other one. And if you can go in both directions, then they're SLOC equivalent. Okay, so how many types are there? If we're looking at two qubit states, there are only two SLOC classes separable and entangled. Okay, and you can transform entangled states into separable states, but not back again. If we go to three qubits, there are six SLOC classes. So the totally separable ones can't be transformed into anything. The three states which correspond to an entangled state and one qubit on its own, in three different ways that can happen. And then two actually inequivalent classes of three-way entangled states corresponding to the JZ state and its, and its family and the W state and its family. And when we get to four qubit states, the number of classes becomes uncountable, at uh, which point I think it's probably no longer worth trying to use types to talk about entanglement. So the attitude which we will take going forward is not to try to rely on types to see inside the quantum state or to see the structure of what's happening, but just to look at the terms themselves. And that's, in a certain sense, that boils down to talking about circuits that made the state. But in another sense, you might think of it as, we'll, we'll see in, the, in a moment, like a more refined way of thinking about that. So this is my moment to take a pause and ask if there's any questions. And while you're thinking about questions, I encourage you to try our software. We do have a question. Um, is there any connection between the the assertion mechanism, the assert uh, thing, and uh, error correcting codes? Because uh, because what we want is to be in a sub some subspace or something like this. So. Uh, good question. I didn't think of it that way. Um, I feel like you, I feel like there must be, but it's probably more complex than. Like actually doing error correction is more complex than doing this, these kinds of assertions. So, hmm. Yeah. Sorry, I don't actually know.
the assertions are slightly weird because if you choose your assertion sufficiently carefully, you can use assertions to steer the state because you're using measurements. You can use yeah. assertions to steer the state with arbitrarily high probability to any other state. So it's not uh, exactly harmless, but. Um, Okay. Um, in that case, I will uh, I'll move on to uh, part two. So, about uh, 15 years ago or so, we kind of realized that multiplicative linear logic wasn't the way to think about entangled states. And Bob Kuka and I, and various other people, started thinking about what to do instead. And what eventually grew out of all that was the ZX calculus. And so I'm going to spend the second half of my talk explaining a bit about the ZX calculus and why I think it's a, a good a good tool for anyone who's working in the area of quantum information to have at their disposal. Um, so before we get into it too much, um, I want to start off at a very high level, which is going some different perspectives on what it is before I actually tell you what it is. So in the first uh, instance, it's a formal theory of quantum computing, which means we've got a formal syntax, which is all diagrams. Every diagram represents a quantum process. I have axioms, which are expressed as equalities between diagrams. And every um, diagram has an interpretation as a linear map. So every diagram corresponds to something in the usual presentation of quantum theory. And of course, the interpretation is sound, uh, meaning that if I have an equation between two diagrams, then they represent the same linear map in Hilbert spaces. In fact, this slide is uh, not telling the whole story because the interpretation is also complete, meaning that if um, if two diagrams have the same linear map as their interpretation, then there is actually uh, a proof in the ZX calculus that they're equal. But more about that later. Um, second perspective on it is that it's a graph rewriting system. So it's a language consisting of labeled graphs. It has some rewrite rules, um, let's just say when you can transform one graph into another graph, and you can effectively compute in this setting by doing a kind of rewriting called double push out rewriting. If you don't know what that is, it doesn't matter. It's, uh, it's a pretty, pretty standard notion in algebraic graph rewriting. Third perspective, the ZX calculus um, is a particular representation of certain tensor networks. So it's an index free diagrammatic presentation of these tensor networks. There are very simple rules for contracting tensors, um, but also there are these transformation laws which allow you to have different presentations of the same tensor. It's also a categorical algebraic theory. So the diagrams I've been talking about so far, they form what's called a prop, or rather the, um, there is a prop whose morphisms are those diagrams. And it's essentially built by a stack of distributive laws on different kinds of algebraic structures, which are which are there. And of course, because it all interprets back into Hilbert spaces, then we know that these algebraic structures are actually hiding in standard presentation of quantum theory all the time. Um, and finally, it is a very convenient representation for quantum programs and quantum software. Um, because it's more primitive than the usual gates and it's more flexible than the circuit model. And it allows you to do lots more transformations of your programs which preserve the underlying linear operation, 
but but are much more flexible with regards to causal structure or the arity of operations or which things have to be states which things have to be operations and so on uh, and that's the principal use that we've been using it for recently all right so why do we even want such a thing so you think back to what a, a standard computer looks like at the physical level it's a bunch of electronic components so a lot of wires and transistors and you know, whatever else and that is very well understood as a piece of physics and we're able to make these things to incredible precision and, and they're amazing and but you wouldn't really want to think about computation down at that level so we then we take a step up and we think about digital logic uh, and this is still rather low level and it's better than thinking about voltages but it's still too low level for the kinds of things that we want to do with these machines and by these machines i mean classical computers so in fact what we want to do is abstract away from that um, digital logic presentation and have something like a programming language where we can talk about higher level concepts that make sense to us on the compiler and the other bits of the software stack to translate that program into something which is um, in, in digital logic. But underlying the design of all those programs, or at least the good ones, is some kind of overarching logical structure, which is talking really about how does computation work as a theory of, of functions, or how does computation work as a theory of electricity. And when we look in the world of quantum computing, we can see that, yeah, the, the physical layer is pretty well understood. Well, could, could be better, but it's, it's pretty much there. We have this rather low level mathematical way of thinking about it. Um, but what actually is the, the equivalent of the lambda calculus in the quantum computing world? And we really do need such a thing because if we want to reason about quantum programs which are large uh, like this thing that i showed you earlier it's a measurement based quantum uh, program if you count the squares in the diagram there's around 1700 of them so the hilbert space dimension of this program of this quantum uh, computation is 2 to the 1764 which is an awful lot of dimensions for something which is quite simple because it's just an adder, like an 8-bit adder. So we're not going to be able to prove any interesting properties of quantum systems if we're working in the Hilbert space formalism because there's just too much of it. So we need to find some abstraction which works. And the way that we approach this with the ZX calculus is to think about which things are distinctive in quantum computing or what's so special about quantum computing and try to formalize them mathematically so you may have read a newspaper i hope it wasn't this one but you might have been unlucky uh, and it says things like this that the switches in a quantum computer can be on and off at the same time so the qubit can be involved in multiple calculations and what this is basically saying is that qubits live in a Hilbert space and you can add them together, right? But, you know, lots of other classical physical systems have a linear state space as well. And we don't expect like miracles from guitar strings and water waves. So that's obviously not the thing that we should be formalizing. Um, it's also an interesting distinctive feature of quantum systems that the quantum states can't be cloned and quantum states can be erased. Um, but that's also not unique in any way. I mean, linear logic was formalized to think exactly about when things can be copied and deleted. And uh, this wasn't really about quantum things. It was about ordinary things like money and cigarettes and I don't know what else. Um, it's quite useful to separate the parts of the quantum computer into the, the ones that follow the linear type regime and the ones that follow the classical type regime. But that's not going to give us quantum theory. Um, a more promising candidate is to think about contextuality. And there's a lot of, well, a growing body of evidence that suggests that contextuality might be responsible for the speed up, if there is a speed up, in quantum algorithms. Um, but in fact, there's 
contextuality shows up in other places as well. So maybe it's not um, maybe it's not the most distinctively quantum thing. So what we settled on was to try and find an axiomatization which talked about complementarity. So the idea of complementarity, as expressed by Niels Bohr in a much more obscure way, is that quantum systems have got properties, but they're not all simultaneously accessible. They're not even simultaneously well defined, which is a very radical break from the properties of classical objects. And I'm going to come on to how that pans out for us in a minute. But the um, the other thing is, what do we actually want to do with this system? So, in my in my work, that I spend a lot of time now thinking about quantum circuits and how to make them better. And the idea of better is pretty simple. We have two circuits, and they correspond to the same unitary map. So we say extensionally they are different; they are the same. But the actual circuits have different properties. I mean, in my example here, uh, one of them has more gates, one of them has more uh, has a has more depth, has more C naughts, and so when we're trying to do circuit optimization, we try to find a circuit which is high cost by these properties that we care about, and replace it with one which is equivalent in terms of linear map, but is better with respect to its costs. And that basically all comes down to rewriting and equational theories. So a very, very simple example of what that might look like in practice is this kind of rewriting system. Now, this is almost trivial. And we can see that the rules are simple things like if I have a Z gate and then a Z gate, I should replace these two gates with just a wire. I have an X gate and an X gate. Well, they cancel each other out. I should replace that with a wire. If I have three C naughts in this configuration, that's equivalent to a swap. Maybe I should just swap those qubits over, and so on. So this is a very well-behaved rewriting system um, because if I go from left to right, I have always fewer gates. I know that it will definitely terminate. It's not uh, confluent. And you can see that it's not confluent by considering three s's in a row, which can rewrite either to sz or zs. So if we're using a system like this, which is not confluent, then we have to be careful in our rewrite strategy in order to make sure that we get a circuit that we like at the end and we don't get stuck in some kind of dead end. But what are we talking about here? We're really just talking about linear maps. We don't have to stick with circuit representations. We can do any kinds of things. And the underlying world we're talking about is the world of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, which are a monoidal category. And I'll explain a little bit more what that is in a minute or two. But any representation of the world of Hilbert spaces will also be a monoidal category. And we can use this, this flexibility given to us by category theory to change the language in which we talk about these things to whichever one is most convenient for the one that we want to do. So having another language at our disposal will be extremely helpful. And so instead of talking about circuits, as we just saw, we're going to change it to the ZX calculus, which looks a bit like this. So here's some axioms that you probably haven't seen before. Um, this is a very powerful equational theory, but it's a very ill-behaved rewriting theory because it's not confluent and it's not terminating um, because you can always find a way to undo a rule that you've already done. Uh, on the other hand, the, the theorems available in ZX calculus are very good. So I'm not going to be able to go into lots of detail. Um, so if you want to get a bit more into it, there's a recent preprint from John van der Wettering, which I recommend that you study at greater length. Um, but I'll try to like give you the, the flavor in the time that we have left. Uh, okay, 20 or 35 minutes. I don't think I want to spend even five minutes on this because I guess everyone knows quantum theory already. Does anyone that doesn't know quantum theory speak up quickly? Okay, too slow. Right. The only thing I really want to get to is uh, two things. First of all, uh, I just want to set up some terminology. So I call a, any model of quantum computing universal if it can represent all unitary maps. 
And in the circuit model, we don't need that many gates to be universal. If we have Hadamard and C0 and the Z rotation, that's a universal set of gates. I can build any entry I want out of those ones. For my purposes, I'm going to prefer a different set of gates, which is not so widely used. So that's why I wanted to mention it. But I'm going to have Z rotations and X rotations and C0. And I'm not going to worry too much about the Hadamard. So these are the generators of my universal set. And it's pretty easy to see that if you can have this one, then you can make the one I had in the previous slide. And I can you know, put these generators together to have lots of, uh, lots of different circuits. And having just said, I'm not going to use the H gate. I'm totally using it on this slide right now. Sorry about that. Um, but you can see how to make circuits here. So I have some states at the top. I put a gate here. I have a wire here. I make another one here. And similarly, if I wanted to make a control Z out of these gates, I have a C naught and I just conjugate its target qubit with the edge and that makes a control Z. Okay, so everybody knows how to compute the probability of a measurement. So let's just do this one example very fast. So if I've got a qubit and I'm measuring Z and I'm measuring X, and it's an arbitrary qubit, so I measure Z. I have probability proportional to alpha squared to see the zero state and probability proportional to beta squared to see the one state. And if I measure x, I have some other probabilities to see the plus state and the minus state. Can anyone see my mouse pointer or am I just like moving that for no reason at all? We can see it, yeah. Good, 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 good. OK, so if I happen to already be in the zero state when I do the Z measurement, probability one, I stay in the zero state. And probability zero, I transform to the one state. However, if I was measuring X in this state, then I have equal probability to see either of the two states here. Right. And that is what I'm going to refer to as complementarity. And we, we all know that if two projectors don't commute, then we can get different um, statistics by measuring them in the two possible orders. And the uh, if they are actually compatible, then they do commute and they have the same eigenvectors. So every time that we have in any non-degenerate observable, I'm just going to think of it as being defined by its eigenbasis. Okay, so if two observables are incompatible then their eigenbases are distinct. And when they're complementary, as Z and X are, they are not just distinct, but they're as far apart as they can possibly be. And so I'll say here that A and B correspond to complementary observables because the inner product from A0 to B0 and A0 to B1 is uh, maximal on both directions. And that is precisely that number there where D is the underlying dimension of the Hilbert space. So bases like this are called mutually unbiased. Um, OK, so that's, that's as much quantum theory as we're going to need for the rest of the talk. And I want to shift gears a little bit towards diagrammatic languages. So as you might have noticed in my circuit drawings earlier, I'm adopting an unpopular perspective which I call the pessimistic diagram convention. So that we start at the top and we go down, right? Okay, so all the diagrams in this talk will be like that, except sometimes it'll be left to right because that's just, yeah, never mind. Why are we using diagrams in the first place? And at this point, I usually like to, um, to give an example. Uh, uh, so think of it as a quiz question. I'm gonna show you a certain quantum circuit written down as matrices, and I'd like you to tell me what it is. One, two, so I'll give a prize to anyone who can do this in 10 seconds. Okay, no prize. Okay, I'll give another prize if anyone can tell me 
Um, what dimension does this uh, operator have? No? Okay, how about an easier one? Is this even a well-formed expression? Right, it's not obvious. It's not obvious at all. So it is, in fact, a well-formed expression. And I can't actually remember what the dimension is myself. If you had just said any number, I would have believed you. It's, uh, but the point is, there is a lot of structure which these objects have, which circuits have, which is concealed by using matrices. And it's not just the, um, the dimensions and the well-formedness, but lots of things which are actually um, internal structure is also concealed by this way. So if we go to diagrams, this gives us a great advantage because we can use the two-dimensionality of the paper, which is very useful when we have both a parallel and a sequential composition, as we do in circuits. And if we want to mix up um, algebraic and co-algebraic things in the same theory, then that's also very um, helpful to use a diagrammatic notation rather than something terrible like Swedler notation. And another interesting point, um, which is that the kinds of diagrams that you allow in your theory um, actually tell you something about the underlying algebra in the ambient monoidal category. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that at all today, but it's it's an interesting question, which I know that that some people are interested here are interested in. Right. Okay. So, so what's some examples of, of well-known and less well-known diagrammatic languages? Um, circuits, classical circuits, and quantum circuits. Uh, Feynman diagrams. So these are even better because these have types on the edges as well. So you see that I've got uh, an electron and a positron here, and they are having some interaction here to produce a photon. Um, we can also find in a, an old paper of Penrose called Application Negative Dimensional Tensors, these descriptions of, of how to work with tensors, which are you know greatly more clear than the corresponding um, conventional notation. In logic, the proof nets from linear logic, uh, which are here shown one-sided and then here shown in later development two-sided ones, Lafon's uh, interaction combinators, um, lots of stuff in category theory or cl compact closed categories. You don't see any diagrams here, but this is secretly a paper all about diagrams, um, which is extremely frustrating that it doesn't actually have any diagrams in it. Um, the other examples of category theory are, of course, the Joyal Street uh, tensor calculus and Joyal Street Verity trace monoidal categories. So I'm going to save everyone from reading all the axioms of monoidal categories and just go directly to the diagrammatic presentation because it is cleaner and simpler and um, other people have proved all the hard theorems already so we don't have to worry too much about that so this is what our diagrams are made up of they are made up of wires and boxes such things are sometimes called string diagrams and they correspond to um, arrows or morphisms or processes in a, in a monoidal category. So I've got some input systems on the, on the wires at the top and they have types, one is A, one is B. I have some output systems coming out the bottom and they also have types. And in the middle, there's some kind of interaction, process, change of state, whatever. The input types get transformed into the output types. And a conventional notation, you would write something like this. So just having one picture does not make a very interesting calculus. So what is a monoidal category? So first of all, we have lots of boxes. And we have some wires coming into them and coming out of them. And I'm just drawing all these with one wire coming in and coming out for simplicity. It could be different, any numbers. And we can see here that the output type of F and the input type of G are the same. Sorry, I'm coming on the screen. The types here are the same. 
which means that it's legitimate for me to plug them together like this. And this is my first operation, sequential composition. So the, uh, the common wire gets plugged together and now the new interface is A going to C. Uh, I can also put my processes in parallel. So I can take F with H and form this new parallel composition, which takes us from A and C to B and D. And it is, I think, sufficient, although maybe I'm forgetting something, but I think it's sufficient to say that all you need to know about these axioms is that these diagrams are unambiguous. Uh, what does that actually mean? Now, I'm sure everyone here knows about the composition of functions, which if you would do it three times, you would have a law saying it's associative. And similarly, the tensor product, if you do it three times, you have a law saying it's associative. And that just means that I can write down this diagram without any brackets. And I can write down this diagram without any brackets. And this one here, being unambiguous, is an interchange law. And that says that if I do the two parallel compositions and then sequentially compose them, that's the same thing as doing the two sequential compositions and then parallel composing them. Um, yes. Uh, there is a couple of special things which are useful. First of all, we have a special type called the unit. And in my diagrams, I don't draw anything to the unit. It's empty space. So if I have a process which starts from the unit and goes to something, I just draw that as a process that starts from nothing, has no inputs, and it produces something. Or perhaps it has an input, but it has no outputs. So it just consumes something, and that's the end. And it's a legitimate um, composition to have something being produced from nothing, and then have that thing being consumed by something and nothing coming out. Uh, and so that's also completely legit. And if this reminds you of the Dirac notation, it is supposed to remind you of the Dirac notation. Things of this shape correspond to numbers in the underlying field when we interpret any of these categories into Hilbert spaces or um, vector spaces more generally. So you can think of this as the state preparation or the cat. This would be the projection or the bra. And this is the inner product of the two. Um, I'm now going to omit a, a whole bunch of stuff and say that you can draw all kinds of crazy diagrams like this. And if you do so, the lines can cross, they can bend, you can go forwards, backwards, whatever. And there is a tower of theorems which when brought together can be summarized by saying that if you can just bend and stretch the wires to get the diagram from one shape to a different shape, those two diagrams were equal by the axioms that I'm not going to show you. And that makes everything much nicer. Okay, so to use a phrase which is widely used in the string diagrams world, only the topology matters, or perhaps more, more strongly, only the connectivity matters. Right. So before we get into the calculus, I want to summarize some of the important facts, which we'll be coming back to later. So as a matter of definition, when I say the word observable, I mean a non-degenerate projective observable on a finite dimensional space. And if you want to think of that as being an orthonormal basis, that's good, because that's what I'm thinking of too. Uh, now, let's revisit the no cloning, no deleting theorems. So we know, thanks to Wooders and Zurek, that is, there's no unitary operations D that can map psi to two copies of itself, and also phi to two copies of itself. So there's no uniform cloning operation, unless it should happen that psi and phi are orthogonal. And similarly, Patty and Bramstein have proved that you can't map two non-orthogonal states to the same um, state, which would be erasing if you could. Um, however, if we turn these theorems on their heads, 
what we get is the following idea that we are allowed to copy and delete quantum states if they're orthogonal. So if I happen to know that my states are the eigenstates of a certain observable, then I can treat them as if they're classical data. And so this gives us the first big um, idea here, which is if we want to talk about observables in quantum theory, which is kind of a, you know, a nebulous thing involving spectral decomposition of operators and et cetera, um, we actually just need to talk about copying and deleting. Uh, so that's what we'll do. So the first part to start with is the copying and deleting. So on the top left, you see an operation marked de delta with one input and two outputs. So we'll call this copying or maybe diagonal if you prefer. And we'll have another operation for erasing with one input and no outputs. And what equations should these things obey if they're really supposed to be copying operations? So first of all, if I copy something and then I copy one of the copies, it doesn't matter which copy I copy. So they're the same. So the left one copied twice or the right one copied twice, doesn't matter. So this uh, looks like co-associativity. Remember, we read from top to bottom. If we have something coming in and we copy it, and then we erase one of the copies, that should be just the same as doing nothing. And it doesn't matter which of the two copies we erased. And lastly, if I make two identical copies of something, and I swap them over, it's the same as if I've done nothing. So in summary, if I take all these uh, equations together, that defines a co-commutative co-monoid. And the word there, the prefix co is to indicate that everything is backwards in the way that you would expect it to be. Um, but I can take the adjoint of my operations, and then I'll have something with two inputs and one output, and something which prepares a fresh state out of nothing. And if I take the operations backwards, I should take all the laws backwards as well. And so then I'll have the monoid laws, which I think will look a bit more familiar. And these are the laws of a, of a commutative monoid. So it's associative, it's commutative, and it has a unit on left and right. And if you think a little bit harder, you can just about persuade yourself to believe a few other things which are true. Namely, that if I have a copying followed by its adjoint, which is kind of a test, so the, uh, the inputs can only pass through if they're the same. Um, that should be the same as, as doing nothing. And the other equations on the right-hand side there are called the Frobenius law. That's a little bit harder to justify, but I think if you think about what it's saying in terms of copying and deleting, you'll find it's pretty reasonable. Right, but if we have these axioms, the axioms for being a monoid and the axioms for being co-monoid, all having, all operating on these same four gadgets, the structure taken all together is called a special commutative diagram for Benius algebra, which is a lot of words. Um, but the important fact to know about it is those equations we just saw, and this theorem. And the theorem says that observables of any finite dimensional Hilbert space are in a bijective relationship with these kinds of algebras. And if you give me a basis called A, I can always make such a Frobenius algebra by defining the copying map exactly as you think it should be. I take the basis vector, I copy it. Since it's an orthonormal basis, I'm allowed to copy them all, ditto, for the erasing map, I can erase the entire um, vector basis. Proving it the other way is a bit more tricky, but it's also true. Um, okay, so now we know that uh, to talk about observables in quantum theory, it actually is enough to talk about these copying and deleting operations. Okay, I'm gonna skip. Okay, just to remind you that uh, when I say complementary, I mean this kind of uh, maximum, mutually unbiased situation. 
the strongly complementary thing I will just pass over for now. It's an additional property. It will come. It's not too too harmful. And the important theorem is the following. So I, I explained already that if I have one observable, it corresponds to a Frobenius algebra. But if I have two of them and they're strongly complementary, then actually they form a Hopf algebra. And I mean it like this. So if I take the green ones all together, that's Frobenius. I take the red ones all together, that's Frobenius. But if I re-bracket them this way, then I get two Hopf algebras. Uh, so Hopf algebra is another algebra, like a Frobenius algebra, which has a multiplication and a co-multiplication, but they obey slightly different equations. This gadget here is called the antipode, and you can define it from the other stuff. I'm not going to show the equation here. Um, so what do we see? We see that if I have a green state being prepared, I put it into the red copy, it gets copied. If I have the green co-copy, the green multiplication, getting passed into the red projection, the red projection gets copied backwards. This equation says that this is a bi-algebra, and this equation says that this is actually Hopf algebra. The antipode, you can think of it as the inverse. And so this is the most well-known example of Hopf algebras are group algebras. And in the group algebra setting, the antipode is precisely the inverse. Um, okay, now the interesting thing that, that happens here is that we are now able to call on a lot of algebra derived from the theory of Hopf algebras, um, which will help us a lot in proving our theorems. And finally, with all that preliminary out of the way, we can talk about the ZX calculus of what it is. Um, okay, so we're gonna start with the syntax. And the syntax is what's called diagrams. And a diagram consists of an undirected graph there's an open graph, meaning that not, um, not every edge has to end in a vertex, so you can have open edges. And the vertices have two properties. They have a color, which can be green for Z or red for X. And they have a label, which is an angle. And if the angle happens to be zero, then I won't write it. It's just so any any vertex that doesn't have a label is zero. So we're going to understand these things as being um, linear maps over qubits. So here's a picture of a of a zx term, which is um, a legit term. So you can see I've got one half open edge at the top, and I got seven at the bottom. And if I interpret this as a process, it's actually got one qubit coming in and seven qubits coming out. This, in fact, is the ZX presentation of a certain encoder for, I think, a CSS code, if memory serves correctly. Um, yes, yes it is. Okay, so what does this mean in terms of linear maps? So this might be easiest if you think of it in terms of not an arbitrary number of, of inputs and outputs in each vertex, but basically the input state, if it's all zeros, it comes out as all zeros. And if the input state is all ones, it should pick up a phase. Of course, global phases are not meaningful in the, in the quantum mechanics, but if we take a linear extension of this definition, then it's quite important to keep that phase there. And the phase that we see, the phase that we see here is exactly defined by the angle. So that's the, the Z spiders, and the X spiders are defined in exactly the same way, except they're defined on the eigenbasis of X instead of on the eigenbasis of Z. So if I plug these, I can make any graph by plugging these wires together. And it's pretty easy to work out how to get a linear map. If you know what the vertices do, then you can easily work out how to put together a linear map for a large diagram. So we will go directly to looking at the qubits. So the standard zero qubit turns out to look like this in the uh, 
in the X calculus, and the one qubit is the same, except this label is now pi. And this is a general feature, like pi is the orthogonal pair with a, a zero. And the plus state is just a green vertex, and the minus state is green with pi. And perhaps it won't shock you too much to discover that the Pauli X matrix is one in, one out with pi, and the Pauli Z is one in, one in with pi on the Z color. And the rotations are obtained by just adding the angles back in. It's the simplest to see with the Z rotation, that's just a green uh, vertex labeled with alpha, and the X rotation is the red uh, vertex labeled with beta for the angular rotation beta. The most interesting one is perhaps the C naught, which is not a primitive in the ZX calculus. And that is kind of the root of everything that's good about it. Um, so the C naught consists of a green dot connected to a red dot. And it can be this direction, it can be this direction, it doesn't really matter. And some important facts here are that if we have any unitary map on n qubits, then we can write it down as a ZX calculus term. And it's easy to see that because I can write down a universal generating set. So if I know how to write down the circuit, I know how to write it down as a ZX term. So I'm in a minute going to move on to the equations, but I want to give a word of warning here that everyone and perhaps even every paper of the ZX calculus has a slightly different set of equations. And there's been a, a lot of work over the years to try and find the best set. So I am using a set which is definitely not the best set, but it's just the one that I like. Um, but with that, let's have a look at it. So I have these equations here, which are all about the interaction of um, vertices of the same color with each other. So we have the, these vertices are called, a vertex with many legs is called a spider. And if I have two spiders which are touching, then they can merge. And if they have angles, the angles are added. And if you think about multiplying two Z rotations together, you can see that makes perfect sense. Having a loop doesn't matter, I can drop the loop. And lastly, if I have a one in, one out with a rotation angle of zero, well, Z rotation of zero is just nothing, so I can just drop the, drop the vertex and just have a wire. So these three things together are called generalized spider rules, and they basically say if you've got um, a subgraph which consists all of the same color, then you can just contract it down to one vertex, or perhaps even none if it's, uh, if it's like this. The second set of rules are all about the interaction of the two colors. And you might recognize here some of the rules from the equations of being Hopf algebra. Um, a bit generalized to take into account the phases, but nothing very surprising here. So we have this rule, this is a bi-algebra. We have the ability of green dots to copy the red dots and red pi to commute with green um, copy at the cost of flipping the angle. And again, if you think about the standard commutation relations, um, you'll see that this is, is true again. Uh, and the Hopf law is uh, in this form in the ZX calculus, because in a general Hopf algebra, the underlying uh, group algebra or the underlying vector space can be any dimension. In the ZX calculus, these wires are qubits. So that's only a Z2 Hopf algebra. So one plus one is two is zero in Z2, which is why these wires can break. So then you can kind of start to see what the shape of a ZX term has to be, because if I've got um, things of the same color, they can merge together. And if I've got things which are multiply connected, all the pairs of wires between two vertices can be removed. And so I always have a simple graph, a simple two colored graph uh, in the end, if I apply all these equations. And this collection of equations is usually called strong complementarity. And then there is one other equation, which is where my rules look really weird compared to some of the papers which are you know, better. 
and I, I like this one, which is a completely bizarre uh, rule, and it's basically saying some circumstances under which you can exchange the colors. So basically, if I've got a green dot surrounded by red dots, which are with the angle pi on two, and I've got some uh, sum over here, some additional term here, I can flip the colors and subtract off the term. Uh, because we're working modulo 2 pi, uh, I can always do this. Right? This is not really a restriction. This is just telling you about how to transform the angles when you move from one to the other. Okay, so this one is secretly all about the Hadamardic gate. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So the first thing to notice is that if um, two diagrams are equal by the ZX calculus, then their linear maps are equal. And that's very easy to check. So here is how we represent the Hadamard. Uh, it's only one of uh, four ways that's a natural way to represent it, but we'll just use this one. And because this is going to come up so often, I'm going to use a special notation for it. So this is just a shorthand, h is equal to this. And if I use this notation, then I can justify my previous weird rule. Um, so if I have uh, a z vertex strength by Hadamard's, then I unpack the definition of the Hadamard, I get this configuration, which maybe looks familiar, and then if I use my strange rule, I get this, and then everything cancels out. And so on account of my, my Hadamard rule, um, I have a symmetry between green and red. So everything that's true about green is also true about red. Okay, so let's see some, some examples. So I showed this picture earlier on of how you might represent control Z if you were working in a circuit picture, and we can do the translation directly. But because I have my color changing rule available to me, I can actually make a simplification here. And we can see that this, by color changing rule is equal to this. Now, in the gate picture, that horizontal line is actually part of the notation, it's not a real wire carrying any information. But we're really in a tensor network here, so this is a totally valid edge, the same as anything else. Uh, and so I can put a, a new vertex there if I want to. And now we can just read off from the picture that this CZ is actually symmetric in its left and right, which was not obvious in the other version. Uh, we can do a short little proof. Um, the usual idea that three C naughts would be equal to the swap gate. So that's pretty easy to prove. So uh, I start off up here and I use the bi-algebra rule, which I just page back a little bit. Okay, it's, uh, this one, you can see that it's got a cross in it. And so when I come through here, I can do the cross, I can introduce the cross by rewriting uh, this one like so. And now you see I've got two parallel edges, uh, so they can be cancelled. I've just pushed this twist through, sorry, I should have said that. And then these two parallel edges can be, you know, let me try and like describe the proof of the order it's actually done here. So I can push these things through the twist and I can cancel off the parallel edges. So I've got now the green one on this side, the red one on this side, and then the twist. And since this one is one in, one out, and it has no uh, angle, I can drop it. And same for this one, that gets dropped as well. And now I can cancel out those edges, and I'm left with two more vertices which I can drop, and I just all that's left is the twist, which I introduced right back at the beginning. So that's a pretty neat and short proof. Um, and another nice example one can do is to show that the uh, Fourier transform can be simulated purely symbolically. So this, we're reading from left to right this time, you can see my input qubits, as I described earlier, this one is zero, this one is a one. This slightly complicated looking thing is the controlled Z pi over two gate. Um, if you unpack it, you will see that it is more or less equivalent, sorry, but it is precisely the standard way of building that gate out of C naughts and Z rotations, except that I've fused together the two control um, vertices at the top here. 
and this is Hadamon, this is Hadamon. So that is how we would present the Fourier transform. And if I just follow my rewriting rules, then I can copy this one. I can use my spider rule and I can change the color. I can change the color down there. I can commute with pi. Uh, I can spider. If I commute with this pi, I'm going to change sign and then they can spider. And if I just read off what that state is, it's the Fourier transform of what I started with. Um, okay, so let's see some more interesting things we can do with that. Um, okay, first of all, a very short one. Let's start off with Liam's project. So Liam was an undergraduate who did his final year project with me a few years back, and his task was to write down uh, a color code in the ZX calculus and to formally verify its properties using the theorem proving tool Quantumatic. Um, Liam's an electrical engineering student and he did not know anything at all about quantum theory when he started this um, project, but he still got an A, uh, not just out of sympathy because it actually worked very well. I'm just going to show you one of the lemmas that he proved. Uh, so this is the circuit that was used to encode the physical cube, sorry, the logical qubits into the physical qubits of this code. So three um, logical qubits are encoded into eight physical qubits. And as it transpires, the decoder is just the adjoint of the encoder. And what we would like to be true is if we encode something and then we just decode it straight away, it should just be the identity, just the same as doing nothing at all. So three wires. And uh, this was proved fully automatically using Quantumatic. We just set it going. And here's the proof. There's the first few steps. There's the next few steps. Oops. There, there's the next few steps. And then eventually it all reduces down to three wires. Uh, yeah, it would have been nice if I had an animation of that. It doesn't take very long at all. Okay, so that's the kind of thing one can do with an automated tool, which is one reason that we would like to have formalizations of quantum theory, which are a bit more compact than huge matrices, which we might otherwise write down. Let's look at something which is a little bit more applied. So the question of circuit synthesis, how do we make good circuits for our operations? Here is a circuit that I showed to you a little bit earlier today. Um, this is an ansatz which is used to prepare the ground state of the H2 molecule. It's called the UCCSD ansatz. There's some more details in its name. I can't remember all of them right now. But as well as being kind of deep, uh, having quite a lot of gates compared to how many qubits it has, we can see that it has a very obvious repeating structure. And so if we formalize just that repeating element in the ZX calculus, we can make some simplifications, which enable us to understand it a bit better. So let's just apply some of our rules. So you can see off in the middle there, I've got green things standing next to green things. So I can do a few spiderings and unspiderings and generally move things around. And now I have that. And again, you can just read from the diagram, which was not obvious in the circuit presentation, but that is a symmetric operation in its inputs. It's just a very useful property to be able to appeal to. In fact, you can just calculate that these kind of things are those operators. So it's a exponentiated Pauli Z uh, with a phase of alpha. So phase of alpha on two. And these things are so useful, we call them phase gadgets. And if we look into this circuit and we peer right into the middle here, we see the phase gadget and there's phase gadgets everywhere. Um, but we also see that every time we have a phase gadget, it's also conjugated by a bunch of single qubit Cliffords. And that happens everywhere as well. Uh, so we can bring that into our notation by just adding those Cliffords to the circuit. 
And so what you see here is what we call a Pauli gadget. So it's again, it's an exponentiated Pauli operator, but this time it's got some arbitrary string of, of Pauli's here, instead of just being Z everywhere. So the one where it says I, I'm not connected at all. At the X one, I've got Hadamard's before and after me. At the Y one, I've got this thing, which is a shorthand notation for an X rotation of pi on two. And this is its inverse. And uh, the Z one, I don't put anything. That's just as it was before. And so we call that a Pauli gadget. And it will be a little bit helpful to have a slightly more compact notation. So we'll change the notation to this. So green still means Z, red means X, and half half means Z. Sorry, half half means Y. And using the rules that I already showed you, we can prove a bunch of commutation rules for these kinds of gadgets. Uh, they're not particularly interesting, but you can see that they're all very simple. It's always some operator on one of the rails commutes with the gadget and then changes it in some way, or doesn't. Right here it doesn't. And those were the single qubit things. And we can also write down the interactions of the gadgets with the CNOTs. And that's also pretty simple. If they're the same color, they just commute. And if they're different colors, then we gain an extra leg. Okay, so that's a very handy calculus, and we're going to use it to study this UCC ansatz. So UCC is an abbreviation for the unitary coupled cluster, and it's a very um, widely used ansatz. And the expression you see on the bottom of the screen is what the unitary operator that um, performs it looks like. And as you can see, we have here um, a bunch of n qubit Pauli operators. And then a little bit of algebra allows me to transform that into a product of n qubit Pauli gadgets. And so now we see that it was kind of daft to build that whole circuit out with all those like complicated ladders and try to turn them back into something simple when the simple thing was already there before we generated the circuit. So we used this to try to define a new way to generate low depth circuits for this UCC assets. And it goes in three steps. The first step is to find all the terms in the summation which commute and lump them together into sets. And then each of the sets will be simultaneously diagonalized. And then once we've diagonalized them, then we can create um, we can create phase gadgets, uh, which are all in the same basis. And then from this, we can generate circuits fairly easily. So here's a kind of a picture of how this goes. Um, so first of all, I write down all the, all the Pauli words which occur in this summation in a graph. And I put an edge between two uh, vertices in this graph if those Pauli words anti-commute. And then I use a graph coloring, a graph coloring algorithm to find all the commuting ones. Because if they're connected, that means the anti-commute, so I can't have them the same color. So in this example, you can see I've only, I only need two sets, I only need two colors to color this graph. Since graph coloring is um, NP hard in general, we just do this with a cheap approximation. Okay, so now I've got my collection of operators that I wish to um, work with. So then I write them down as a bunch of Pauli gadgets. And then using um, the, the rules that I showed you earlier and the definitions of the Pauli gadget in terms of the phase gadget, these can be simultaneously diagonalized purely symbolically. 
And so what I now have is in the middle of my circuit, I have a product of base gadgets. And at this side, I have some Clifford unit tree. And at that side, I have some Clifford unit tree. In fact, sorry, I have the inverse of this one. And you can see that they're even built up that way. So that's H with this, the C naught with this, and so on. Uh, and then the last step of, is to deal with this um, big phase gadget. But the product of phase gadgets is always a phase polynomial, which is a thing like this. If you really haven't met it before, it doesn't matter. But there are quite a few techniques for generating circuits based on a phase polynomial. So we pick the, uh, the most efficient one available and then build the, the phase polynomial circuit from this. And that turns out to work very well. So it's uh, fairly cheap in terms of compute time. And we observed a reduction of depth on average of 75% compared to the naive circuits that we started with. And in the best case, it was a depth reduction of 90%, which is really the difference between does your circuit work or do you just get noise as the output? And although we've been discussing it as being a particular strategy for these UCC ANSADs, it actually works for anything which has this, um, this form here, which is very common in many quantum algorithms. And if you've downloaded PyTicket already, you can find this in the manual as PolySimp, one of the many circuit simplification methods which are available. Um, okay, so I think I'm going to basically wrap up now, um, unless people are desperate to hear more. I will say just a few more things. First of all, there is a rather wonderful website called zxcalculus.com, and you can find uh, an easy to follow tutorial uh, giving all the basics of the calculus. You can find an up to date list of publications involving the ZX calculus, um, a list of people and what they work on, and uh, a demo of PISIX. So, if anyone doesn't know what that is, Physics is a Python library, which you can download. It's free. And it allows you to make ZX calculus uh, graphs. And it knows lots of clever tactics for simplifying them. And in fact, physics implementations of circuit simplification routines are, uh, I wanted to say they are currently the best. But it's been an ongoing battle between the, uh, the physics team and a few other groups who are working on this. So I would say with high probability, the Zeris calculus method of doing t reduction is the best, uh, but that might be slightly out of date. There are other tools available if you're really into this uh, Wolfram language. Some people working at Wolfram have recently started using Zeris calculus to try their quantum sim uh, circuit simplification. The, uh, this is based on the formalism of multi-way rewrite systems. And it, it looks kind of crazy. I, uh, I won't deny it, that looks kind of mad. So that is a proof of, I think, teleportation working. Um, but I, I recommend you try it out for yourself if you're interested in this, uh, in this kind of rewriting theory. And I think that's where I'm going to stop and ask for questions. Okay, thank you very much, Ross. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Titouan, can you? Uh... Yes, so there is a, a kind of an old question about um, the continuous parameters you have in your circuits. I think it's for um, the variational thing you show mm -hmm. and the question is um, in the slides where you use a quantum state with the parameter theta which which is a continuous parameter um, does it mean that you are uh, discretizing the parameter theta 
Um, not well. I mean, it, in the implementation, it'll be double precision. So yes, but mathematically, no. That's still a continuous parameter. Okay, there is another question. A bit earlier, you say that you wanted to make a logic that highlights the complementarity property. Could you please explain again why the X calculus does it? Ah, okay. Well, I would say that my idea to make a logic basically failed because this is not a logic at all. But let's uh, let's think a little bit about where the comp. Why is this to do with complementarity? I guess so. Uh, if I go back to my my equations, uh, uh, yeah, okay. So I want you just to pretend that this isn't here, this antipode thing, because that's useful in higher dimensions. But in two dimensions, it's not uh, the the identity is the antipode. So what is this this kind of saying is that I've got on one basis, which is corresponds to one observable, and another um, basis corresponding to a complementary observable. And it's not really obvious from this picture is how this complementarity is appearing here. And one way that you can think about it, and you can make this mathematically precise, is that if I have some classical information coming in here, I'm encoding it in a certain basis, the, the X basis. And then I'm broadcasting it out in these wires here. And the other one is trying to receive it. But because it's encoded in the complementary basis, it can't. And so that's why this equation holds that there's no way for me to transmit this information through here. Now that interpretation is very hand wavy and it relies on a different way of treating single wires and double wires. And if you'd like to understand how that works a bit better, then I recommend you pick up the book called Picturing Quantum Processes by Bob Cooker and Alex Kissinger. And they go through that, that kind of idea of classical information, quantum information, um, quite carefully. However, you can prove that this particular set of equations um, will hold for these strongly complementary observables, which is slightly more than merely being complementary, because I asked for one additional property, strongly complementary, is a certain closure property of a subgroup of a group that I didn't mention. But if that strongly complementary part doesn't hold, then that just means that this equation is dropped and the others remain. And so any set of, so any observable defines a Frobenius algebra, and if they're complementary, then you get, if you have a complementary pair of observables, then you get these additional equations. And the strong bit is just to make them into a properly well-behaved bi-algebra. Um, I suppose that probably wasn't very helpful, was it? Okay. No, I don't see any other question. Um, I, I might have one. Uh, I like to uh, extend the last question a little bit because so you you present in a bit. You, you spoke a bit of uh, quantum logic, but very quickly. And if I understand well, uh, one of the motivation behind the ZX calculus was in a way to as a step toward quantum logic. I don't know if I'm right or not, but uh, I think and. Do you, do you know? Okay, so what what can the X calculus give us if we think about uh, quantum logic or complementarity in general? Like uh, like uh, you had this slide with uh, Niels Bohr, this more general notion of complementarity. Do you think there is something? Because no one is a lot of people are speaking of the X calculus nowadays, but I don't think anyone links it with the. Uh, the logic, logical, quantum logic motivations. <clears throat> yeah, and from a kind of philosophical point of view, um, I stopped thinking of it as a logic because I stopped thinking about propositions as types in this calculus. This is like a, a term language, and the, the types have nothing really interesting to say here in, 
you know, everything inside is a prop. So we can count, that's enough. Um, but then quantum logic has no deduction, so it's not really a logic anyway. So maybe it's it's more, it is also a failure as a logic, I guess. Do we think anything more interesting can be said about complementarity directly? I would tend not to go that way. I mean, I, I'm coming from a, a mathematical perspective rather than a, a physical, philosophical one. And what I hoped for in the past was that this might be a, a new way to think about mutually unbiased bases, which, as, as I'm sure you know, the number of mutually unbiased spaces and uh, even quite low dimensional vector spaces remains an open question. So I was kind of hopeful that we might be able to do something in that direction using this kind of structures. But it seems that the structure of strong complementarity is actually a little bit too strong because you can only ever have a pair of strongly complementary observables. And the reason for that is is kind of boring, and because um, because a group only has one identity, algebraically speaking. So I don't really see a way to move into tackling these uh, questions about when, in in higher dimensions, when you can talk about the the additional complementary partners beyond the original two. So for me, if I wanted to try and take the sort of foundations of the ZX calculus further, I wouldn't go in the direction of the paradoxes of, of Niels Bohr. I would go towards a nice concrete algebraic question, like how many MEBs are there in dimension six? Just, you know, probably three, but who knows? Okay, thank you. There is another question. Um, so they say, in the presentation, we relied on the structure of the circuits to optimize it. Are there ways to reduce the depth of an arbitrary circuit? Or maybe optimize it with respect to other parameters? For example, the number of T gates, or just moving them closer to the output? Ah, OK. So yes, this is a very thing with the calculus is quite good, in fact. So what one can do, uh, so if I just, uh, advanced to my additional material. <clears throat> right, let's show this slide. So here we have some kind of random arbitrary ZX term. And in particular it has no angles in it, which is quite important. But it's a theorem, it's like a normal form theorem for Hopf algebras that anything that looks like this can be transformed into something with only two layers. And there's lots of quite radical simplifications you can do in general synthetic terms to squash together gates, um, move phases out of the way, unify T gates into, into um, uh, S gates. Uh, and things like this, which rely on being able to do a lot more than what you can do in the circuit world, which is just commutation. And so the difficulty is that if you start with a circuit and then you squash life out of it and something like this, and you want to then go back to your uh, standard gate-based quantum computer, you still have to turn it back into a circuit at the end, which is actually kind of difficult. However, if you have a measurement-based computer, then you can pretty much just execute this thing already. It's already a measurement-based computation as it is. So the, the translation into the circuit form is really just because we started from the circuit form. What is sometimes useful is the fact that the circuit already has a well-defined causal structure, and it's often helpful to maintain that or at least record it as we rewrite the ZX calculus terms. And if at the end of the day, we need to turn the um, ZX term back into a circuit, then that's again, it's helpful to have that causal structure there. But yes, the answer is you can do like quite, quite radical, quite radical reductions in the, in the size of, in the, sorry, quite radical changes 
to the structure of circuits. And an interesting potential use of this is for quantum devices which have um, lots of qubits but not great coherence time. So if you can transform your deep circuit into a circuit that uses lots of ancillas but it's not as deep, then you could potentially benefit from improved fidelity that way. And the the flexibility of the ZX calculus to not care which edges are time-like, which edges are entanglement, uh, which states are being prepared and which are being projected, gives you a lot of flexibility in that respect. And so there's a PhD student at UCL who's working on this at the moment. UCL being the one in London, not the one in Leuven. There is an, another question. Um, uh, uh, can the X calculus be used for the verification of algorithms using some oracle? And does it have something to do with query complexity? Um, I'm going to say the answer to the second part is no. It doesn't really have anything much to say about query complexity. And the, the kinds of questions that ZX calculus is made to answer are equational questions. So it's sometimes difficult to handle oracles in this setup unless you can present the oracle in the oracle's behavior as an equation, which is sometimes possible. Um, so for example, the hidden subgroup problem has been treated in the ZX calculus by Stefano Cogioso. And uh, Tituan, did you not do this recently? Was it not, it was a different algorithm, right? Uh, yes, yes, we, we, we did with uh, Simon and uh, Johan Danilo, an internship student. Um, but it's exactly as you said, we have some uh, specific situation where the oracle has a behavior that uh, can be put into equation easily. Mm. So, um, about what you, you said about uh, T-gate reduction and all circuits optimization. Uh, people are asking about um, somewhere they could read about all those uh, optim optimization techniques. Mm, let me uh, let me see if I can find it. Then and... So the, the authors who've worked on this are Neil de Boudra and Harney Wang, mo most recently. Um, but of course, the place where you should go to look for this is on the, uh, um, the zxcalculus.com webpage is uh, right here and if I scroll down a bit so you can see like some of the topics which have been studied in just in the last year uh, So here we go. If I click on this, and I believe this is currently the best method of T gate reduction. There is also an older paper from Alex Kissinger and um, John Van der Wettering, which was at that time also the best, but I think it was, was superseded. Uh, I'm assuming you can still see my screen. Yeah. And you can see also the use of the phase gadgets in this paper. Okay, there is also a question. You So you say that the hop axioms are too strong as an expression of complementarity 
are there any other candidates? Um, not that I know of, not that I know of. It's, so it's possible to construct counterexamples to the, uh, to the bioalgebra rule in four dimensions and higher um, using a set of, of mutually unbiased bases where, where the, there's a phase shift by a non-rational amount. And so in, instead of forming a nice uh, closed group like you would require in bioalgebra, in fact, it never, it's, a, it's an infinite set of things. So the, the bioalgebra law can fail on concrete examples. But it's such a powerful algebraic um, rule, you wouldn't really have that much of a, of a calculus left if you didn't have something like it. And so there are calculi which are derivatives or successors or variations on the ZX calculus. There's the ZW calculus, which tries to axiomatize the Z, the G, Z state and the W state. And the W state is quite different um, algebra, whereas the GZ state is the same as the Z spider from ZX. Um, well, the algebra is much more complicated, uh, and it's not quite as nice to work with. And there's another calculus called ZH, which is a bit better for dealing with things like the um, Toffoli gate. Uh, but it also as a bi it's also a bioalgebra, I think. So in short, I don't know. I don't have a good candidate for an alternative to the uh, to the bioalgebra. So there is a, another question. So you just read it. You just remarked that the X calculus techniques can help in the case when you have a circuit that is large in size but small in depth. But why is this the case? Uh, so that's not quite what I said, or uh, okay, maybe it's what I said, but it's not what I meant. So the, um, if you have a, a, a circuit which is on few qubits but is deep, then if you normalize this according to the, the ZX rules, then you get a tensor network which makes no particular claim about which qubits should be um, so like which vertices in the graph should be considered as qubits and which ones should be considered as gates. And if I take one of my vertices from the middle of the graph and say, actually, this is a qubit which was prepared and then entangled with the rest of the graph and then measured, that's an equally valid interpretation of the tensor network of the whole circuit than thinking of it as a gate through which some other um, physical qubit would pass. Now, because you have this choice, of which ones you would like to think of as being physical qubits, or which ones you would like to think of as being gates, you can rearrange the whole thing so that some of the, the vertices which previously were gates can now be ancilla qubits, which will be prepared, entangled, measured in a kind of semi MBQC kind of way, uh, where some of the rest will continue on into the next layer. And those ancillas can then be reset and reused. And in this way, some things which were gates in sequence are now happening in parallel. And this way, by using more ancillas, you can reduce the circuit break. That's, that's what I've tried to say. I might not have got that very well the first time. OK, so I think there are, there are some people writing. If you like, you can just ask your question, maybe. And oh, yes, yes. Uh, you can talk directly if you want. Easier. So maybe I'll ask a question directly. So uh, thanks for the friend, thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, I, I, it's, a, it's a quite general question. So is there a, a quantum programming language uh, that contains as a, as a special case, like high level, uh, classical programming languages like Python or things like this, 
So maybe I can be a bit more precise. So imagine I want to implement Grover's algorithm, let's say, but where the, the oracle is a classical function, but it's, it's complicated. So it's, it's a complicated classical function for which I don't want to write the full circuit, but I can write some C code or something like this. Mm -hmm. Is there a way of writing the overall quantum algorithm I, I would get, like which is applying Grover to this complicated classical oracle without having to go through the procedure of compiling the C code to uh, a reversible, uh, a reversible classical circuit, which I then interpret as a, as a quantum circuit. Hmm. So, I mean, obviously, it has to turn back into a quantum circuit at some point, otherwise, you can't do anything. But there is one idea which may or may not be useful. I haven't. I don't know. And that is that there is the formulation of the Zex calculus due to Harney Wang which contains uh, the AND operation. And so you, sh you may be able to write down your C function more efficiently as a standard building circuit that way. However, it's not so clear whether you can resynthesize anything remotely efficient from that once you go back to the quantum world. Okay, I see. Thanks. There, there is, okay, yeah, maybe I'll stop here. Thanks. Other people ask. I should say, if, uh, if, if Simon or Titouan knows the answers to these questions, you can also answer them. It's totally fine. Hello, sorry. So I was wondering another thing. Uh, wondering, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, so if you do, uh, maybe I don't completely understand the graphical representation, but let's say I do an intermediate measurement. I have a circuit with an intermediate measurement, and based on my classical outcome, I want to do a rotation in my uh, uh, on some qubits. Can I represent that in this diagrammatic form? Yes, but uh, I didn't show you how to do it. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, there is there's kind of two two reasonable approaches. One of them is the one which I kind of alluded to when I was talking about the complementarity, which is that you can you can think of uh, single wires as classical information and double wires as quantum information. You can rebuild the whole calculus uh, uh, as a as a doubled version of itself, which is more like speaking with mixed states and channels instead of pure states and unitaries. And yes. in this setup, it's relatively, it's okay. You can build measurements that way. Um, I personally find it easier to work with an extension, which is this one, uh, where as well as having my angle on the label, I've also got a Boolean expression. And the intended semantics of this is that should the, um, this expression evaluate to true, then I take the angle as being alpha. And should the expression evaluate to false, I set the angle to zero. And with this, um, with this you can represent measurements and conditional operations um, relatively straightforwardly. I just make a fresh um, Boolean val variable for every measurement that I'm doing. OK, yeah, thanks. Uh, so actually, if I go here, that's maybe even more clear than what I was saying. OK, so now we're interpreting everything as, as um, super operators rather than as unitaries. So this is my, my conditional thing. So my Boolean expression is just a, oops, sorry, I'm not sure. This is my conditional thing. So my Boolean expression is just a, a free variable. My angle is pi, and if x evaluates to zero, then I just have this projector, which is the projector onto plus. If x evaluates onto one, I have the projector onto minus. And then I can use this variable elsewhere in my term in order to encode the fact that this, uh, this later, later, there's no causality here, um, this other operation will depend on that measurement outcome. 
Okay, I can somehow infer x from another part of my graph. Yeah, so actually we're not encoding any any causation here at all. We're encoding correlation. So if yeah. I I'm just saying that x is determined by the measurement and some other thing depends on that. But actually there's no enforcement of that relationship. Maybe causally the other thing happens first and x is determined by that. Okay. Okay, but here you apply rotation if x is something that doesn't give you out x in some way, right? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Could you say again? Oh, uh, you said uh, you add the Boolean function and then you say uh, if x is like uh, true, then we actually do a rotation and otherwise we don't? Yes. But how does this get x out in some fashion? So x doesn't, um, doesn't come out, right? So I use this to define a super operator which has got oh. a term for every possible value of, of every possible variable. So in my little uh, example here, I just have x, so I have two terms. Yeah, I understand. Okay, thank you.